Welcome everybody to the Building Equity Podcast Foreclosure Report for January of 23, where we look at the latest numbers that were released for December of 22. Today, I'm going to be joined with Auction.com's VP of Market Economics, Darren Bloomquist, as well as Equity Trust's Head of Education, Mr. John Bowens, who's a great friend of the show, of course. Thank you guys so much for taking the time to uh, watch this content. And listen, to start, I got to give you my disclaimer. I just got to do it. Listen, we're not giving you any financial advice. This is strictly just for educational purposes. And uh, there's the disclaimer. Now listen, how about a commercial? Today's show is brought to you by IRA Title Pro. If you're buying and selling real estate with your IRA, you should try closing with IRA Title Pro. Visit them at IRAtitlepro.com. You're going to be very happy. Very excited to get into the conversation. It's granular. I mean, if you're watching this, you are a uh, foreclosure nerd, but that's what we're trying to do because we believe there's a snowball effect happening in the foreclosure market where there are there's going to be an influx of distressed properties in late 23, 24 hitting the market that real estate investors can take advantage of. So uh, I hope uh, you guys do that. And as always, feel free to head over to IRAtitlepro.com. Take a look at the foreclosure reports where you can sign up for your state-specific foreclosure reports, and we'll make sure those get emailed to you every single month. Let's get to Darren Bloomquist with Auction.com and Mr. John Bowens of Equity Trust. All right, here we are. I'm sitting down here with uh, what I love to say is the wizard of foreclosures, Darren Bloomquist with auction.com here. And you know, this being the third time we're sitting down, I had to bring the head of education at Equity Trust, Mr. John Bowens. John, say hello to Darren. Darren, John. Hey, Darren, good to see you. James, thanks for having me on today. Appreciate it. Looking forward to it. Same here. Nice to meet you, John. Or re-meet you. I guess we've crossed paths in the past, but um, good yeah. to be here as well. Yeah, just so you know, if you uh, don't feel intimidated by the chemistry, Darren, that John and I have, because we have been doing the our show for a couple years, so uh, just don't feel insecure. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> well, now okay. I do feel insecure after you say that. Listen, we are. Uh, we may joke around, we may laugh. Obviously, foreclosures is a very serious issue. So when we uh, say, "Hey, there's an increase in foreclosure," nobody's excited about that. But uh, to set the table, Darren. It sure looks like kind of the narrative that uh, we've been saying on the IRA Title Pro end is that real in, real estate investing season for distressed properties, it's it's almost game time. And uh, what I what I saw on a LinkedIn post that you referenced was an article uh, that I thought was great. What a market downturn means for real estate investing in 2023, and kind of the essence of that article was if you're a real estate investor and you're interested in distressed properties, now is the time in January to set your strategy, set your game plan uh, for what's coming. Because what we saw foreclosures start-wise the last half of the year, those properties should be making their way into the market come 2023. So from a foreclosure start standpoint, Darren, can you just kind of bring us up to speed, uh, speed on what you saw with the December's numbers, how we closed out 2022, and in your opinion, what we're looking at for 2023? Yes, actually, at, you know, by the end of December, and this is data from Adam Data Solutions, we saw uh, foreclosure, fi foreclosure starts specifically up for the whole year up 169% year over year compared to 2021. And December was, I believe, the 11th consecutive month where we, or 11 out of the 12 months where we'd seen triple digit increases in foreclosure starts. A couple of comments on that are that you, you have to take that a little bit carefully because the numbers, I, I always have to give this caveat, the numbers in 2021 yep. were so low. So we're coming off this extremely low level of foreclosure starts. Uh, and the numbers are coming back. Now, even as of December, we were at about 80% of pre-pandemic levels. So you're seeing these foreclosure starts doubling, but still below pre-pandemic levels, which I'm going back to 2019 for pre-pandemic levels. So just to nuance it a little bit, but the main point is, yes, we're seeing the increases coming back. Um, and that should translate into more completed foreclosure auctions in 2023. We may not see it as extreme of an increase because there's a lot of efforts being made to help people prevent foreclosures, which is good. 
Um, but I would say, you know, just to back up to your earlier comment is, you know, in a, in, in a down cycle and a downshift in the market, no, no matter how extreme that is, I don't think we're going to see an, as an extreme downshift as we did back in 2008, 2009. But in a down market, investors actually are very become even more necessary for the market to be to be healthy. I think the, that's the investors, are the ones who are who are willing and able to step in during those down cycles and provide a floor for the market. So I actually feel pretty passionate that, um, you know, it's certainly there are bad players, investors, but they play a vital role in actually um, getting us through these down cycles more quickly. Well, listen, so John, before I come to you, and I, I really want to ask you the question, John, about what you think investors should be doing to get ready, whether it's from a funding standpoint, legal standpoint, or so forth. But one of the things I've been promising, Darren, I mentioned this on the last couple uh, calls that we had regarding foreclosures, and John, I mentioned it to you, but it's live now. So I'm going to very quickly and the listeners ira title pro listeners and equity trust ira account holders when you are coming it just may take a second here let me get over here and can you guys see my screen yes yes good perfect so on ira title pro right now we have under our reports our nationwide foreclosure report where this show will always be updated we've got nation level data but what we've been working on here is that investors can sign up for their state-specific foreclosure reports that will automatically be emailed to them every single month for free. And that's when we start talking about kind of this uh, this type of data. And, you know, Darren mentioned it. We're using the same Adam Data Solutions data. But this is where we can track foreclosure starts, the notice of foreclosure sales, and how many properties actually went to auction and were picked back up from an REO standpoint. And we do have all of this available. So head over to IRA Title Pro, and you will be able to sign up for that. And with that, let me just kind of segue back to you, John, here and get your opinion on what you think investors should be doing as we get going here. Well, one of the one of the topics that I'm talking to a lot of investors about right now, and this comes from my background in self-directed IRAs and, and what I do professionally and personally, uh, James, as you know, and, and, and Darren, to get you up to speed, in addition to teaching and educating I'm also a real estate investor, so I'm, and when I say real estate investor, my focus is on single family residential properties, uh, mainly buy and hold, but also private money lending. So I spend most of my time looking for single family residential rental opportunities, as well as working with investors who are flipping homes, uh, or maybe they're using a burr type method and the opportunity for me to be able to use my self-directed IRA to make private money loans to these individuals. And one of the topics that's being brought up quite frequently now is, okay, with interest rates now up at, and feel free to jump in here, what, six and a half to 6.75, we're talking, you know, a 30-year fixed mortgage, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, which is, if not over double what it was prior to interest rates increasing, a lot of investors are actually finding that the economics of using an IRA as a cash buyer to purchase properties instead of leveraging and buying more properties with a 30-year fixed mortgage at a very low interest rate, the IRA actually becomes much more economically feasible and financially responsible for them to approach. Now, of course, that's assuming that they have the available inventory. There's an opportunity to buy a property uh, preferably from a motivated seller at a discounted value. So as a real estate investor, we can create appreciation. And in our IRAs, that allows us to be able to benefit tax-free or tax-deferred in the case of a traditional account. So James, answer the question. And what I would encourage the audience to, to consider is if you're in a position where your IRA, your 401k, your other retirement plan, your thrift savings plan, whatever type of account you might have, if it's been invested solely in the public markets and you've suffered losses, most of the conversations I'm having right now, unfortunately, and I sympathize with everybody that's on today's call that's taken a loss, but most of the conversations I'm having right now are with respect to people who have suffered severe losses. And so the question is, is, 
can you invest in real estate? Can you find single family residential properties or maybe even apartment buildings uh, or other uh, investor related real estate opportunities like a private money loan? And can you do better? Can you beat the stock market? Now, in, in my case, through these very challenging times over the last six to 12 months, I've been able to do that. I've been very fortunate in that regard. That's not to say that's always going to be the truth in the future, of course, but we've been able to weather the storm. And so I'm spending a lot of time, James, talking about from a portfolio perspective, from a retirement savings perspective, how we can weatherproof our portfolio. And so this conversation is very timely because I'm getting a lot of questions, of course, about, hey, John, how can I identify opportunities in the real estate market? Where do I find inventory? And so when I hear Darren Bloomquist and I hear auction.com, and oh, by the way, I just worked with an equity trust client that closed on their first real estate transaction with their self-directed IRA through auction.com. And it went through very smoothly. Um, I'll say, Darren, I actually spoke to one of your representatives at auction.com, one of the, the client service representatives. And uh, they were very helpful through the process, very helpful to, to me and to the client. And, and it went through very smoothly. And so maybe there's an opportunity here for IRA investors uh, to look at foreclosure auctions and uh, as an opportunity to buy single family residential rental properties. This particular case, by the way, was a um, rental property. The, the investors plan on buying and holding this property for longer term. But when I looked at the purchase compared to the comparables in the market, um, I know with confidence that they bought the property and uh, they're going to have they're going to have almost immediate appreciation. And that was an all cash purchase. They, there's no debt on the property. Their IRA had cash, their IRA paid cash for the, for the entire transaction. So I'll, I'll continue to monitor that and hopefully report back here on uh, on the success of that transaction. That's awesome. Me, I love to hear that story. <laughs> let me ask you, Darren, too. So it's kind of like John just set the table for investors. But with some, let me share my screen here because I think it was somewhere around just almost 70,000, just shy of 70,000 starts, foreclosure starts uh, in third quarter 22. And let me make this a little bit bigger here so you can see it. And let me know you guys can see this, right? Yes. Yep. Perfect. I'm going to click over here on industry starts so we can just uh, have this be accurate. And, uh, you know, quick math, if I come over here, you got 21,000 in October. We got 20,000. We got just about 20,000 in December. We're just shy, just over 60,000 starts. When you were looking, Darren, we've spoken about that Black Knight mortgage delinquency data. These starts that hit in third, or I'm sorry, fourth quarter last year, what are we, what are you expecting to hit the market from a foreclosure standpoint that are actionable properties investors can go after? And then, and I can't, I can't expect you to get too accurate here, but knowing right now, December, the median home price was 366, 366,000, which was about 11% down from the peak in June of 2022. But the real question everybody's got their eye on is, when are we going to start seeing sellers take the haircut on these prices and get that in line? So my first question is, what are you expecting from completed foreclosures to hit the market and when in 23? And when do you think we're going to start seeing that price haircut? Okay, yes, great. I think, well, first of all, historically, and this is very much of a rule of thumb, a rough number, but we we see about 50% of the foreclosure starts end up as actual foreclosure, completed foreclosures, which is that's when it's the opportunity to buy at the foreclosure auction. And then if, if they're not sold at the foreclosure auction, they become bank owned REO. And, and so you can roughly take that foreclosure start number for 2023 and, and divide it in half to come up with what we'd ex or 2022, sorry, and, and yep. come up with what we'd expect in 2023. Now, there is because it is about it varies by state, but it, it takes about a year uh, to to go through the foreclosure process. Um, we are I think we're being conservative, but our our forecast for 23 in terms of market wide com completed foreclosure auctions. Is just over 100,000 for the year nationwide. It's not a big number in in uh, to be honest. 
and what what we're seeing with the foreclosure starts in 2022 is what I'd I'd attribute primarily to the backlog of deferred or delayed foreclosures during the pandemic. Sure. sure. I think we will see another wave of foreclosures coming through in 24, 25, a bigger wave, to be honest, probably, that is um, the result, really, uh, the unintended consequences of the stimulus that we've that was put yep. forth during the pandemic. And yep. now we're experiencing the hangover from that stimulus. And that's causing more some distress to start to emerge. So to answer that question, and uh, your second, what was your second question? I already forgot. So um, my, my second question was really about when we can expect sellers to take a haircut, but don't okay. answer that yet because you kind of just, you got me on a, a, a good point here. And let me do this. I want to be able to kind of use this show as an example, uh, but you guys should be able to see my screen, right? Yep. All right. So Darren, when you mentioned, hey, we're talking about year to date, I want to say there was about 243,000 starts in 22. Cut that number in half. You talk about 100 to 120,000. I think the article I just referenced was about 137,000 completed foreclosures coming in Q1 through through Q3 of 23. Our numbers are really close. And what's awesome here is that you're helping the investors that are watching this show read our our charts, so essentially, uh, which is a good thing. Now, the other thing that you mentioned uh, is essentially we got to pay the piper for all the homes. Let me stop this share. All the homes that sold. I'm, this is my question for you. Pay the piper. And what you could say is late 23 into 24 for all the homes that sold at peak prices with 80 percent folks getting mortgages. Now prices start coming down. You've got folks that are upside down. And this is what I think you're talking about the wave coming. And with that, let me just show you this very quickly, because I brought this up to you, uh, Darren, a couple of times before you see this on the screen. Mm hmm. Consumer credit card debt is at unprecedented levels right now. And since we've been doing this for the last three months, Darren, it's continually rised. And subprime auto delinquencies are at 2019 levels. And again, I keep looking at it from a, I, I say from a commonsensical standpoint, I'll stop the share. You've got people that are going to max out their credit cards. You've got people that are going to skip on their uh, auto loans. Now you start seeing that we get into maybe this first quarter of 23, sellers start lowering their prices, which brings down the valuations. You obviously have the data about what's going on mortgage delinquency wise, which I'm fascinated by. Um, but is this where we start seeing the prices come down, which kind of plays into the narrative of this wave in late 23, 24, of people upside down, they start defaulting on their loans, and those start going through the foreclosure process. It was a long-winded way, but <laughs> I just gave you data to support it. Yes, yeah, we're already we are seeing sellers start to adjust pricing. Finally, we've been we you know we're the platform. We're not selling these properties. The sellers are the banks, the mortgage servicers, and we've been telling them, hey, the market is shifting. You need to adjust pricing if you want to sell these properties. Otherwise, you'll end up owning these properties and you'll have to sell them eventually, you know, six months down the road when home prices may be lower than they are now. So, so yes, we've seen some evidence already in the fourth quarter that some of the sellers are adjusting pricing downward and that's good. Um, the, the good news for buyers is that some of the buyers who rushed in during the pandemic have pulled back or scared and so investors who are willing to take on that risk um, can get a bigger discount now, or you know, the discounts are more favorable. Uh, to the story that John was mentioning earlier, we are seeing um, the average at foreclosure auction, the average discount between below what we call as is value, not after repair value, but as is value of homes has jumped up uh, as of the fourth quarter now to 29%. I think the article that you referenced, it was at 23%. It's jumped up Correct. even further to 29%. So you're basically 30% between below as is value. That helps provide that cushion. If home prices do go down, um, you still even have that built-in equity in the home 
and uh, so so buyers are demanding those lower prices and getting the, getting them. Sellers are now starting to adjust, and we're you know I can't name names, but you know one of the major uh, sellers has just agreed to they during the pandemic they had what what was called um, they weren't even discounting some of their properties in some areas because the market was so hot, but now they are so. We're seeing evidence of that even, I think, in the first quarter through the first half of 2023, and that's good news for buyers out there. And I think your other que- your your question about the the second wave is 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 very true. And and I think as the market, uh, we we would expect home prices to go down overall in the market in many markets uh, across the country and in the first half of 23 at the very least, if not in t- for the full year, and that's going to leave many borrowers um, at risk, at higher risk. And we are seeing with FHA loans specifically, um, I believe that it's 20% of the the FHA purchases in 2022 are now underwater, and I believe it's as high as 60% of those purchases are have limited equity, less than 10% equity in the homes. So it's already emerging as a risk, and the there there's something called an early payment default rate that is has been jumping on the FHA loans and so that's an early warning signal as well that those loans originated in 2022 near the top of the market are going to be at, at higher risk so one that's that's unbelievable data that you just gave us there because if if anything and i think commonsensical for investors can understand this you know your market you know where you're at i'm in naples florida we had some of the largest home price appreciation in the country if you were in boise if you were in phoenix that's where the huge haircuts are going to come if you're in you know uh erie pennsylvania maybe not so much right but there's no question at least the narrative that's happening, there's a snowball effect happening here. And it's, I would say the credit card debt, the auto loans, what you just mentioned with FHA from 20%, 22% being underwater. In some cases, what was the 60% metric? So that was, uh, I was specifically honing in on FHA and VA loans, which are the low down payment loans in yep. the market right now. So those 20% of those that were originated in 2022 specifically are completely underwater 60% are within 10 have less than 10% equity so they are marginally underwater not quite underwater but close to it and so that's specifically that high risk group um that is that we see in in this market today and and that's where we're also seeing those early payment default rates jump up um above they actually spiked at the beginning of the pandemic, those early payment default rates, and they came back down, but now they're going back up again. And I think we can unanimously agree that we haven't even seen sellers begin taking the haircut on pricing, which is just going to make that number even worse. Um, as I look here, I think you know the median price of a home sale is down 11% from the peak in June, at least December's numbers. Um, so there's a snowball coming, and it, it makes so much sense in that article if you're an investor, you're getting your strategy ready because it's coming. Whether you're picking up short sales, whether you're going to the courthouse steps, or whether you're uh, you're going to use an auction.com um, or or so forth. So that's that's really interesting. Uh, John, I want to see if you want to do you want to jump in at all? Because uh, if yeah. not, go ahead. Yeah, th- appreciate that, James. And you know, uh, again, Darren, really appreciate the time today, and you know, getting some some real. Uh, data insights from somebody like yourself that that represents uh, auction.com, uh, I think is really, really powerful. So again, I appreciate it. And I know all of our viewers appreciate it as well. What I'm thinking about right now, and I talk to a lot of investors at in my local real estate investor clubs, and you know everybody's looking at what happened in follow-up to the Great Recession. And I think a lot of people are thinking, okay, um, this may be a a um, a replica of uh, and I could follow the same roadmap as I did after the the Great Recession. But the reality is is that the more mortgages are different today than they were back, you know, in the Great Recession. And the reality is is we don't have uh, that very unhealthy, if you will, mortgage 
uh, climate that we did. So all that, all the subprime, the no doc loans, or as people call it, liar loans, all those went away, right, with regulation, with the Dodd-Frank Act. And I think we're starting to hear that in some of the data that you referenced. Uh, for example, I think you said in 2023, uh, you're forecasting, uh, is it 100,000 completed foreclosures? Is that correct? Uh, 100 to 150,000. Yeah, 100 to 150,000. And in, correct me if I'm wrong, you probably know the exact number, but back in 2009, was it 2009 that there was, was it th about 3 million, just under 3 million or may have been over? The million? exact metric we're looking at is it was just over 1 million in 2009 and then also in 2010. So if you combine those two years alone, there were 2 million over a two year period. Um, and I think it was over a five year period there, there was, uh, I believe, um, over close to 5 million. So yeah, that it, it pales in comparison. Sure. Right, right. And, um, you know, obviously we're looking at, you said 150 and then in 2024 and into 2025, expecting a, a bigger wave. And so one, one of the things that I challenge myself with as an investor, and I challenge all investors with, is we can't necessarily look at the roadmap after the Great Recession and say that's the same roadmap we have to follow now, today, in 2023. It's a different roadmap. It doesn't mean that there's not opportunity. I can't tell you how many times investors say, well, there's no inventory, interest rates are high, um, real estate investing just doesn't make sense. Well, then I think about it and I say, okay, well, uh, th there is some, some information with respect to housing shortage. And that is therefore driving up the, the price of rents. And so, there are opportunities out there, but as investors, we we have to find them. Um, so that that's sort of my challenge. I'll put it out there, and mm -hmm. what I challenge myself with. That leads me to my question for you, Darren: is with respect to inventory um, and um, shortages, and really just supply the economics of supply and demand, so that so that everybody can understand on today's call how that works. And then obviously we have unemployment as well. So um, I think the discussion that was just being had was with respect to, of course, you know, all right, are these people with carrying high credit card balances and other consumer debt, um, are they going to lose their job? Because the reality is, is what happens? Well, statistically, we know people stop paying on their credit cards and other consumer debt, and it's usually their home mortgage, which is the last thing to go, right? Yep. And that mm -hmm. usually goes when they lose their job. We saw that in the Great Recession, and we'll likely see that continued into the future. In fact, it's interesting because I talked to a lot of real estate investors that um, they use property tech data, which I know James is, you know, very deep into that space and, and does a great job with that. And um, you know, they're using property tech data to basically find properties, just like you mentioned, Darren, that um, are underwater. Um, a VA loan or FHA loan, uh, low down payment loan in 2022, it's very easy to get that data, right? We know when they bought the property. We know how mm -hmm. much they bought the property for. That's all public information. So people can use property tech to basically say, hey, there are these 300 houses that I know there's a good chance that these people are underwater. Let me send them a letter and see if they're interested in me buying their property. And so I'm, I'm sure that a lot of those people are actually getting those types of letters. So yeah. that leads me to, in a roundabout way, that, that <laughs> leads me to, to my question, Darren, which is um, that the supply and demand question um, in this whole notion of, well, property values are not going to go down um, as much as everybody thinks they're going to go down because of housing shortages. And we know, I think the figure is something like 8% um, housing starts year over year down like 8%. It could even be more by now. I'm sure I'm sure James knows that data point right off the top of his head. So 21%. Can, there, there, there you go. Yeah, I knew he'd know it. I knew he'd know it. Um, so, so Darren, can, can you speak for our audience a little bit more to, um, you know, what you're seeing in terms of the supply and demand and, and what that could potentially mean in the future? Yes, I think, you know, there's kind of these two sides of the supply and demand argument that I think I'm somewhere in the middle. Uh, I do think that we're in a much different, to go back to your original point, we're in a much different situation than we were back in 2008, kind of on the precipice and the perfect storm of things. And so, the, and and the supply and demand ba balance now is, is much more favorable for the long-term health of the housing market. 
meaning that because there's not this, there, there's not a big overhang of supply. Now there is a, a very compelling argument from the folks at Zellman Research Housing Research that over the next decade we're actually we are on a little bit more of a precipice than we might think when we look at the more short-term numbers and when it comes to demographics because of their projecting population gr growth and and thereby household formation is really going to slow. It was a slow it, between 2010 and 2020 household formation was the slowest. It's been since the 70s, I believe, according to their research, and they're believing they're projecting it's going to slow even further, which is it's that's more of a long term conversation of supply and demand. Um, I think on the short term, we're, we're pretty well off and that is going to help provide more of a floor this time. We're not in a house of cards situation where everything will just crumble at the first prick <laughs> um, or everything will just pop at the first prick. Uh, so. I think that's that is important to note. The thing I would say, and I think you made some really good points, is that with real estate investing, each down cycle is going to be different, but the principles of real estate investing stay true through all of that. You know, the the principles of real estate over the long term increasing in value, and the principle of buying low. If you can buy low uh, and sell high <laughs> or rent high you're you're going to be in good shape or if you know like my wife's great grandfather who was did very well in real estate investing says if you take care of a house for 20 years it'll take care of you forever um that those kind of principles are going to remain the same your tactics are are going to shift and change depending on the market conditions and uh in today's market i think your tactic of that you mentioned of reaching out to homeowners, motivated homeowners who may want to sell is a great strategy of, you know, tying into those principles. I think, you know, buying it at at our auctions is a great um, a great way to achieve those principles and abide by those principles that that stay true over time. And, you know, one thing I would mention about that people may not know about buying a foreclosure auction is that if a person does have equity in their home, the real, like, I think it's actually a cool mechanism to protect their equity at the foreclosure auction. If the the winning bid is above what is owed to the lender, that there's surplus funds generated, those actually go back to the homeowner. So they're they're walking away with equity to show for that that property, even in the foreclosure situation. So just a, a side note there. But I think hopefully that addresses your question. But I, I, one thing I want to ask you too, and maybe this is a separate conversation, but I would love to do a case study of one like the buyer you mentioned or someone like that, or just provide some education to our buyers who may not know that they can leverage their self-directed IRA to purchase these properties. I think that'd be a, a great uh, educational piece for our users on our site who may not know about uh, resources uh, such as equity trust. Absolutely, Darren, be happy to do that. And it was interesting because the couple that I referenced before, um, they didn't know anything about a self-directed IRA. And they were they were in the process already with, with auction.com and they had a good idea that they were gonna purchase properties through auction.com. And they had done some other real estate prior to that um, for, for quite a few years. And um, but they they didn't they had sort of heard of a self-directed IRA, but uh, didn't really know anything about it, because, as you can imagine, you know, there are no national television campaigns about buying real estate in your IRA <laughs> and financial mm -hmm. advisors and wealth management consultants and every other person that benefits and monetarily benefits from the supply chain of financial traditional securities like stocks, mutual funds, anything tied to the stock market, if you will. Uh, they want to stay as far away from self-directed IRAs in real estate as possible. So when you have that kind of dominating presence that's been around for, you know, 200 years um, in self-directed IRAs investing in real estate weren't even possible until 1974 in the Employee Retirement Income Securities Act. And then it wasn't until the early 80s, James, you know this story, that our company founder Dick Desich put together one of the very first real estate transactions with IRAs 
And then um, it wasn't until really the dot-com era when people started using online education and resources and could actually get information about this. Um, so I'm not surprised to, to hear that, that there's, uh, if you will, a, a gap in knowledge and some opportunity to be able to educate other folks. So we'll definitely have to collaborate that collaborate on that offline in another session. So as we as we wrap up here, I want to be able to get your take, uh, Darren, on some of the interesting states and markets. And then, John, I want to use this as a uh, just to kill a couple birds with one stone. I want to show you how to manipulate the foreclosure data that we have. So folks are able to kind of see a narrative. And specifically, you talked about how to find those properties. Well, Equity trust investors that are interested in foreclosures have the ability to sign up for our state-specific reports where they're going to get every single month. They can get down to the zip code level, how many starts, how many notice for sales, how many properties went back to uh, the bank, right? So if there's starts in a zip code, then they have the, they know the county. They can go right to the county website and be able to see this information so they can reach out to those sellers. And when, when, you know, obviously the strategy changes between a start and now that property is listed for sale because the heat's on that, you know, homeowner, uh, or they go down to the auction themselves. So I'm going to kind of show you that. The other point that I just want to make is nobody believes that we're going to see a wave of foreclosures like we did during the, uh, you know, the financial crisis of 2008, 9, 10. But I don't think that there's been a more favorable time to start looking at distressed properties than what's getting ready to come over the next year into next year than what existed during 2010. I mean, let's not forget, that was 13 years ago. So here, if you're an investor and you're interested in trying to get stuff at a discount, that's why we're creating this show. That's why we're creating these state-specific reports. Not that it's going to be as big as you know, the financial crisis, but it's going to be significant. And that's why we want to watch it. So let me just share my screen here. And in doing that, John, I want you to watch here how we can uh, talk about some of this data. And let me know, Darren, if you can see my screen. Yes, I can. All right. So, John, if I'm in the upper left, we can sort the foreclosure data by volume, or we can look at it based on the housing units in a given market, which tells a completely different story. Because if you look at volume, yeah, your Texas's, your California's, your Florida's, New York's are always going to be at the top of the list. But that doesn't tell me the story. And what I have here is I'm looking at industry foreclosure starts. So I'm going to switch over to housing units, Darren. And what I see here is South Carolina, New Jersey, Illinois, and Delaware. And this is obviously looking at what it, what happened in uh, in December's numbers. Is there anything that jumps out to you? Because I was very surprised to see South Carolina uh, hop in there toward towards the end. Is there anything that you find interesting? Yeah, that, uh, South Carolina. I'm not sure what's going on there, but um, I do. You know, the New Jersey, Illinois of the world are actually not too surprising because. As I mentioned earlier, I think a lot of this jump in foreclosure starts we're seeing really has to, it's not the new distress that's coming. It's dealing with the legacy distress that was delayed by the pandemic. And New Jersey and Illinois were at the top of that list that had, to be honest, you know, New Jersey was experiencing the the consequences of having such a long foreclosure process. They were still dealing with a lot of distress from the 2008 crisis in 2019. So anyway, that's oh, wow. a little bit of a side note. So I I think a lot of the distress you're seeing there in Illinois and New Jersey is, is actually still left over from the last crisis. So that's not too surprising to me to see that. That kind of aligns with our numbers um, of where we see volume on a now, per capita basis. Now, again, John, just remember for, for investors, they could at any point come in here, throw in a zip code and drill down to the zip code level. But let me just show you here, when you start looking at the notice type and we switch over to foreclosure, which is trustee sale, these are properties now that are at the stage in the foreclosure process where a notice for sale has been put in place by uh, by the courts. And right here, Darren, Michigan, Georgia, Texas, Arkansas, Michigan jumped up here. 
And again, I'm sure we're looking at yeah. these are, you know, the moratorium in place. But if I'm in Michigan, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand what's going on here because there's a wave of properties that are getting ready to uh, go for sale is my, uh, my, my, yeah, and, and I think it has somewhat to do with the, the, the speed of the foreclosure process does vary quite a bit from state to state. That's one of it's can be a little frustrating for investors, but Michigan is one of those where it's, it's faster. South Carolina, I was just looking at a heat map I have of where we're seeing volume return the quickest in terms of the next step, the, the actual completed foreclosure auctions. And I do see South Carolina is one of the higher states nationwide. We're at uh, just under 50% of pre-pandemic levels. South Carolina is at 56%. Michigan is at 99%. So <laughs> that aligns with what you're showing there, in, at least in terms of those two states. Um, and, then, and we tend, the, the areas that tend to have the faster foreclosure processes where the numbers are coming back quicker tend to be in the Midwest. Um, just uh, looking at my heat map, the, the green, which is where they're coming back faster, is all up through the Midwest and and a little bit into the southeast as well and northeast um but john anyway bowen's, yeah john bowen's just exactly why i like doing this show with darren because he he's got these little nuggets of information i'd never know about the foreclosure process speed in the midwest is faster than let's say jersey and jersey still has residual foreclosures making their way through the process from the the financial crisis um let me hit reo and you could see here, Wyoming, Alaska, Pennsylvania, and Illinois. I mean, Wyoming, of all places, hitting the list here last month. So, uh, hmm. again, just interesting stuff. Uh, John, I wanted you to be able to see these uh, these numbers. But anything on, on kind of what we saw there in December from a Wyoming standpoint or Alaska that jumps out to you, Darren? Well, our Wyoming uh, numbers, and this is the third quarter, it's a little bit outdated, but it, it's directionally good. They were at actually above pre-pandemic levels in terms of completed foreclosure auctions, which become REOs if they're not sold. So there were at 100, Wyoming was at 103% of pre-pandemic levels, so they've actually gone up above. They, it is a lower volume state, as is Alaska. You're not going to yep. see as, as many as you made the point earlier. Um but one of the things I'll just point out about REO too, the REO auctions are a little work a little differently, and we do those REO auctions as well than the foreclosure auctions, where you actually don't physically have to go down to the the courthouse to bid, um, which you do in a in many states with foreclosure auctions. But you so if you, I mean, you want to be careful about buying somewhere far away from where you live, but you you can go on auction.com for instance and bid on properties in alaska from anywhere in the country i'm, I'm glad you brought that up darren um and i did want to ask uh whether it's you darren i would i would assume be you darren or james feel free to jump in is for for all of our viewers especially those that are using a self-directed ira and maybe they've never gone to an auction uh they've never gone online they don't know how that works and although auctions have been happening for years and years and years where there's an auction company that shows up at a property and you get the specific dates and times and you go there and you actually physically bid at the property site, um, a lot of people don't have any experience with that. And I know that it can be intimidating to think, OK, I got to show up at the county auction. Um, I have no idea what any of this means. Um, there's paperwork I got to fill out and tax ID numbers I got to provide and registrations and I got to bring a specific amount of money and it's the first time I'm here and I feel like it's the first day of school where everybody knows what they're doing but I don't uh, you know mm -hmm. I feel like you know as an investor that's like has always been my experience uh you know and in, in being new at something and so it it seems as if now there is like auction.com there, there's technology that allows you to simply from the comfort of your own home be able to look at these types of property opportunities and, and execute on making a bid and going through that process. I think it would be helpful to share uh, maybe at a very high level sort of what that process looks like. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great point. And, and auction.com really feels, if a company can feel, but we feel passionately 
about that exact thing is that especially 20 years ago if you went to a foreclosure auction it was such an intimidating experience especially for a new investor we're trying to i guess the word is democratize that and make it accessible to everybody and so if you go to one of our auctions you'll see our auctioneers there in bright green shirts to identify and we try to, we are extremely professional um and we'll explain things to you to as a new investor whereas some of the other uh, you know auctions that are being held are, are 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 the opposite end of the spectrum so i think what what i would advise first of all is to go to an auction without planning to planning to bid just to observe and i would you know i would of course i'm biased but i would you know recommend that you go to an auction.com auction to see how that's held and see how it works and there's a whole process you know our our people have ipads where you can register to bid you do have to show your proof of funds in most states i would just say in ohio is one of the two exceptions florida and ohio are two places where you can actually bid online at foreclosure auctions which is different than than other states um but it is in most states it is an all cash on the spot type of thing and so you're you're bringing cashiers checks and usually people bring them in different amounts to uh to try to get as close to whatever they're going to pay as as possible and then any excess we would re, re, refund back within a certain amount of time and so the other thing to expect is that you're not going to probably see the inside of the house before you buy it you're you'll know what the house is uh, you can drive by it. You can get a sense of the neighborhood, but there is that risk involved with buying at a foreclosure auction. You probably won't be able to see the interior of the house. And then uh, another thing. I mean, I could probably go on and on. And I would love maybe maybe we could get our one of we have a whole buyer success team, and maybe get someone from that team to really talk through it very systematically with your folks. We'd love to do that. Um, but anyway, uh, you know thing to expect is that many of these get canceled at the last minute so you go to an auction you may have a list of 20 properties and half of them end up not at the last minute getting canceled for for different reasons so that's another thing that sometimes surprises people and the last thing i'll say is we do have in many states technology that we've brought to bear on this to try to help which is called remote bid and it um the two biggest states where it's been used so far, but th there's many other areas where it's available are Texas and Georgia. And this allows you actually, the auction is taking place in real time. It's an actual event, but a remote bid allows you to bid remotely from your mobile phone um, without even having to be there physically. And we've we've heard from one of the things that surprised us about that is from newer investors that was a very powerful tool because they didn't feel so intimidated they they went through the process digitally and weren't seeing all these other investors who felt who who looked like they knew what they were doing and maybe gave them the cold shoulder and so it kind of empowered them um, through that process so that might be something to consider as well I tell you what, as a uh, as a takeaway here, I will 100% take you up on seeing if we can get somebody from auction.com with you, Darren, and and really talking about the whole process through. I can do a whole show just on the hidden uh, ghosts and goblins that you could inherit with a foreclosure property from a lien standpoint or unpaid association dues or water or any of those things that you could inherit that could cost you more money. Uh, it's just doing your due diligence. And the last point I'll tell you is as a national title company, IRA Title Pro, we get requests all the time where folks are trying to buy a property tomorrow and they want a title search just to see if there's any ghosts and goblins. It can't, you know, the turnaround, depending upon the state, doesn't work that way. But we did create an amazing tool on IRATitlePro.com. Our property intel reports will be able to pull and he leans on a property, uh, foreclosure information, bankruptcy information, comparable sales on a given property. It'll give you a great level of data that we can aggregate in seconds that should be able to kind of uh, give you at least a little bit more ammunition. It's not a full title search. 
You know, we're not willing to ensure that information that's there. But when you're under a crutch time wise, it's the best thing going because there's nothing else out there available. That's for sure. So uh, with that, John, I just want to see if, if anything else that you want to kind of say before we wrap up. Uh, no, I, I'll just uh, support the comment that Darren mentioned about uh, go to an auction without sure. the intent to buy and um, that experience. And also, I'll say for investors, that's a great opportunity to network with individuals and get to know local real estate investors and see how they're buying and what they're doing. Um, I work with plenty of investor friends that they go to auctions because they are interested in buying. But when they leave the auction and they didn't buy, they didn't feel like they wasted their time because they often connect with some very valuable individuals. And the last comment I mentioned on that is if you have um, um, children that are old enough, bring them along to that auction with you and teach them the teach them the things that you're that you're learning and that you're doing. And uh, oh, by the way, there could be a potential there. I always have to put the add this in. There could be the potential there to actually pay them for services provided and then have a Roth IRA open for them and then start funding a Roth IRA. Now, I always add that, you know, make sure you validate all this with your CPA. But there's a lot of ways that you can, you know, create a legacy and uh, do good for your children and good, do good for yourself all at the same time. So back to you, James. Again, Darren, really appreciate it. Look forward to connecting on some of those other items. You know, based on how dry of a topic this is, I'm sure our listeners are wondering how any of us could get married being experts in title insurance, <laughs> self-directed IRAs and foreclosures. But uh, truth be told, it's possible. You know, we'll just leave it at that. Uh, listen, thank you so much today's show. We were here with John Bowens, head of education for Equity Trust and the foreclosure wizard, vice president of market economics, Mr. Darren Bloomquist. Thank you guys so much. I'm expecting uh, new data to come out here in mid uh, February, where we'll be able to come back out. And hopefully, Darren, if you're willing to join us, we'd love to have you again. Uh, and John as well, where we can kind of keep our finger on the pulse because the snowball is rolling. And uh, there's more opportunities for real estate investors. So thank you guys so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, James.